Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching this. Today we're going to focus on part two of 9-11 slash terrorism. And again, we need to be, remind ourselves the argument that the victims of 9-11 were the result of causation from the past. And my job is to provide evidence. So we're going to look at the Middle East, the region where 19, all 19 of these hijackers came from. And when we look at this region, we need to make sure we understand we'd have to spend, you could spend a lifetime getting the depth of knowledge on this region to give the justice it deserves. That's for any event in history, but history is so vast. It's so broad. This is going to be a more of a sport-centered version of the Middle East in its history. Now, we need, we kind of associate ourselves with the Middle East, probably thinking of turbans and deserts and radical terrorists and poverty. But we need to make sure we're open-minded enough and educated enough to know that it goes much, it's much broader than that. We like to oversimplify things because we have the path to least resistance, but we should not do that. And we need to make sure we're conscious of the fact that terrorists in the Middle East are a very small, 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 small minority. And looking at this region, we need to make sure we remind ourselves that it is geographically located in a in a geographic gem located between Africa, Asia, and Europe. And we'll talk about that geographic location and role played. The Middle East was coined that by the British who were there in the 1850s. And then eventually it will stick in America thanks to a very famous naval commander, Alfred Mayon. There have been multiple groups, ethnicities, empires who have contested over that region over the years, from the Sumerians to the Babylonians, the Assyrians to the Persians, who have contested over this. And really the Middle East is a story from riches to destruction to exploitation to nationalism. It is a story that where the major middle it's a location where the major religions that we know, we kind of think of in the West, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, all originate in this region. We need to make sure we understand it's a cradle of civilization in many regards. It was considered the cradle of civilization, especially with its diversity, especially with its technology, especially with its education and literacy rates. It was at the apex of civilization at one point, and we'll talk about that very briefly, just to reinforce. Now, we must understand how the world geography plays in history. At one point, the Middle East was at the heart of the Silk Roads, the major routes of travel, of trade and tourism and ideas and innovations traveled right through this region. And we kind of have to think about ourselves when we travel. We tend to stop whenever we're going great distances. Maybe it's to rest at a hotel. Maybe it's to eat. Maybe it's to get gas. Uh, maybe it's to shop. So we need to understand that these, when these Asians and Europeans and Africans are traveling through the Middle East or even coming to the Middle East, that they're coming here and they're stopping along the way and they're spending money, which is going to give the Middle East an economic boom. And it's going to be a place where people are flourishing along this, this, these routes. And we need to make sure we understand that the Middle East is and was at one point in time at it was the model for other civilizations to to follow it was at the apex of its power looking at roughly 800 years ago it was the leader in innovation as i mentioned it was a leader in technology it was a leader in education it was a leader in literacy rates it was a very wealthy place now we must understand that we can't talk about the middle east without talking about the nation of islam now, as I mentioned, Christianity was founded there. As I mentioned, Judaism was founded there in the nation of Islam. Now, Islam came about later, came around 600 AD, Prophet Muhammad, and it is going to sweep through the Middle East, and it's going to establish one of four caliphates. Now, a caliphate is a leader, a prophet, who claims to be a descendant of Muhammad, and it will unify this, this area. You can see it stretched all the way across Northern Africa and up to Spain and to the east, all the way to Afghanistan. So again, we must be conscious of the fact 
that the that Islam is at the heart of the Middle East. Now, many of these these countries you see here named Iran, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan. This these are not secular states, meaning where America, church and state are separate. We don't make past laws based off the Bible. Where in these Islamic states, they're using the Quran to pass laws. They're using it as a way to establish control over the population. And it's much stricter, so it's non-secular. It's not divided from the, there's no division from church to state. Church is the state. State is the church. So make sure we're conscious of that. But as we see, this will expand. And it will eventually be challenged by Christians with the Crusades, which are sent down in there, some by corrupt popes, but again to establish a establish back a beachhead into the Holy Land, Jerusalem. And these will not have much success. They will have limited success. But we will see again, going back, and the reason being is this was a very powerful state at one time. Now we have to ask what happened. How did they fall off? from becoming, from being the, the epicenter of power. And we must remind ourselves that history is all about choices of individuals. Individuals dictate history. Individuals dictate events. These choices have consequences. The choices that they don't make have consequences. The choices they do make have consequences. And again, it's easy for us to cast stones at dumb decisions that we consider dumb decisions of the past based off of decisions that were made at that time, which was the present. And it's very difficult to foresee what would happen. Now, why did it fall? Based off choice. There was, there's, by most historians' account, accounts, the reason why the Middle East fell was the choice of a governor of a city called Atar. O-T-R-A-R. And you can look into it if you'd like. But the governor of that city, there was a caravan that was sent by another individual from Asia and looking to do trade. And it was filled with, with all kinds of goods, gold, clothes, um, things from Asia. And this person was looking to do business and expanding trade in the Middle East. However, the governor thought of them as spies and he will actually round them all up. He will arrest them. He'll have them executed. In due time, when that leader finds out this is what happened to his caravan, he sends three more messengers to the area. And when he does, he asks the Sultan, who's actually the nephew of the governor and was powerful in that area, to punish that governor for his discretions towards his, his people. And instead of doing so, the Sultan will actually kill one of them, shave the heads and mutilate the other two and send them back to this man and let him know that he does not want to do business. Now, this is a obvious sign of disrespect. And it so happened that he actually did that to the greatest military power in world history by many historians' accounts. And that would be the Mongols and Genghis Khan. And if you look at Genghis Khan, he's going to be very upset about this. He's going to demand revenge. And he's going to send his army from Asia into the Middle East. And by all accounts, these Mongols were, we talk about them today because of their prowess on the battlefield. They were elite soldiers of the time and seemingly unstoppable against anybody they ran up against. Whether that was the knights from the Europeans or the huge empires of the Chinese and their millions upon millions of populations, whether it was the samurai whether it's the Middle Easterners, these Mongols would destroy everything in their path. There's an account of Genghis Khan's daughter's husband, which would be his son-in-law, was killed outside of one of the cities in the Middle East. And he asked her what she wanted him to do to the people of that city. And she said, kill them all, men, women, and children. And by modern day accounts, up to, they estimate up to 1.7 million people were slaughtered in that city. Not one person survived. And there's other accounts that when dogs and cats were even seen running around, she ordered them to be executed as well. So we can see the brutality, the, bar the barbary of challenging Mongol rule. And 
they are going to destroy a lot of these these cities in the Middle East, and that that civilization which was on top of the world will crumble, which will actually open up opportunities for Europe then to shine, and Asia to even grow um, as a result. Especially Europe, they'll be the ones who benefit most up here. But we can see the Golden Horde, we can see the Mongol Empire, we can see the, the size of it. It is enormous. You can see where it stretches into the Middle East here. It really gets into Saudi Arabia much. Uh, but you can see how it dominates China over here. Never actually reaches Japan due to location, geographic location. There's a couple of times they tried to, but uh, weather permit weather did not permit them to invade twice. There were tsunamis that came in and destroyed part of the Mongols' fleet. Anyhow, we can see the, the fact that this was a great empire. It will unravel thanks to the Blonic Plague, thanks to the trade routes drying up, and we will see it change. Now, I'm always looking for history, looking at history for nuggets, things that I can use to inspire me, and I came across came across it a couple looking at Genghis Khan and talking about leadership. Now he's a rags of riches story. Guy who was born in the worst situation possible. I mean, nothing we could even fathom today. Even our poor today couldn't even fathom. He lived in a land of just barbarians at the time and very divided people, the Mongols. And he's going to be the one who unifies these, these different tribes. He actually kills his own brother because his brother stole his fish. That's how desperate they were to survive. I'm sure there was other things. I'm sure his brother, older brother, didn't treat him well, but he ended up murdering him. And we can see the brutality of these people. He was kidnapped at one point. Um, but he's going to eventually find a way to unify all these Mongols. Now, his lessons on leadership for us, he always argued that you should not be too proud, that pride is as difficult to tame as a, as a mountain lion. And he also argued that anger overcoming anger is like defeating the world's greatest wrestler. Now he had divided his empire into four different sections, four parts, and he knew he was mortal, where many people thought they were immortal and tried to get people to believe that. He knew he was mortal. And he was somebody who would show up, even though he ruled this empire, you could not tell by looking at him. He dressed very modestly. He did not get all into the glitz and glamour. Now those four sons of his that, that rule this empire will be quite different. It will be the opposite. They will be all about the glitz and glamour. Now he tells them that about pride, you need to swallow your pride and not think you're the smartest or strongest everywhere you go. And a metaphor he uses and tells them is that even the highest mountains in the world have to accept the fact that animals walk on top of them at times. Another thing he, he forewarned is he tried to tell them how far he had come, how far the Mongol Empire had expanded, how far they've come as, an, as, a, as a group, but they cannot fall in love with chasing, chasing fast horses and fall in love with all the jewelry and all the glory that comes with it. Because if they do, they'll become slaves to it. They need to simplify their life. So I think there's a lot of leadership lessons we can pull from Genghis Khan. We can pull from this experience. But again, Going back to the Middle East, we see it unravel thanks to choice and consequence, that causation. Now, the next part three, we're going to go into these dates. We're going to tap into the history of these dates. I actually added one, 130, 1933, which I think all of you guys will gravitate to um, when I get to it. But this will be part three, coming to you soon. I appreciate you guys being such a fabulous group of individuals, and I look forward to uh, working with you the rest of the year. Thank you.